Ladies and gentlemen, dear sirs and madam, welcome. This is uh, uh, Human Faces of Climate Change, Science in Practice for Just Transition Conference, conference organized by National Center for Climate Change, a part of the Institute of Environmental Protection National Research Institute. My name is Magdalena Petroniak and I will have a pleasure of being the host and moderator of today's uh, event. And what's going to happen today? Today we are going to talk about the role of contemporary science in search for practical solutions in order to mitigate and stop anthropogenic uh, uh, climate change. In order to uh, make the scientific tools effective, we need to involve uh, society not just in the implementation phase, but actually much earlier, much earlier in the stage of elaborating and co-creating such solutions. For that to happen, scientists need to leave their offices and laboratories and go out into the world. Today, we are bringing together scientists, op opinion leaders, experts on climate change for all around the globe to discuss and share best practices on climate change and just transition. But before we start this fruitful discussions, I would like to invite you to listen to a message that we received from Mr. Michał Kurtyka, president of COP24 and former minister of climate and environment of Poland. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm so happy to be able to welcome you at the next session of our Human Faces of the Climate Change Conference. This time we are going to look with the eyes of ordinary people, everybody, like uh, workers, uh, taxpayers, consumers, children, women in poor, rich country, employed or unemployed. Uh, we want to look at the phenomenon of just transition and make sure that uh, we understand what does it mean and how can we use science in order to properly address challenges linked with the just transition. After COP26, after the completion of the Katowice rulebook, which happened in Glasgow, we right now have a legislative framework for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So right now, it is of extreme importance to be able to see how an effective implementation of climate policy can happen. And this implementation will not be possible if we do not look at challenges from the perspective of ordinary people. It will not happen if we leave somebody behind. It requires then time, it requires energy, it requires resources, it requires first and above all understanding and awareness. This is what human faces of the climate change conference is about and uh, I welcome you very much. I wish you a great discussion and I hope that together we can make sure that just transition is really taking place. Thank you very much. Good day. Thank you, Mr. Kurtyka. And now it's time to introduce the program of today's uh, conference. Today we have gathered uh, renowned experts on climate change and each of our experts will address three fundamental aspects of bringing science into the process of just transition. Each of our experts will answer three um, uh, questions that we prepared for the conference. The first one will be about how to translate theory into practice while uh, providing scientific solutions to problems of real people. Secondly, we will discuss how to match, how to connect science and society, especially when we are looking for answers to the just transition processes. And finally, uh, the question about the dialogue. Is the social dialogue future of, this, uh, of science? How can we find models and mechanisms 
to create the dialogue between scientists and society and decision makers. We will be talking about the language and also um, involving um, spiritual and intellectual leaders in green um, transition. Those are the key topics we will tackle today. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce the speakers and experts in the first panel of the conference. Uh, I'm super happy to introduce our distinguished guests, uh, who are Professor Jim Ski, co-chair Working Group 3, Mitigation of Climate Change, IPCC. Hello. Hello. Uh, we will also have Professor Katarzyna Jansikowska from the Institute of Sociology, University, Jagiellonia University in Krakow. Good morning. Um, together with us is Professor Andreas Loschel, Professor of Environmental Resource Economy and Sustainability from the Ruth Universidad Bochum, and Professor um, Febe Konduri, President-elect of the European Association of Environmental and Natural Resource Economists. This is the, the first panel of experts, and I would like to give the floor first to Professor Jim Ski from uh, IPCC and, and ask for your presentation uh, on this three um, emerging topics of the conference. Okay, uh, th thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation uh, to, to actually speak at this event. I do have some PowerPoint slides. So if, if the organizers could put, the, yeah. put, put these up, I, I, would be, I would be happy to speak to these. Now, just to say, in terms of the three questions, I'm going to address them very indirectly in, in, in my presentation, because frankly, I have not done very much scientific work, as it were, on just transition. All of the work I have done has been of a practical nature. And if I might comment on the first question about translating theory into practice, I think this is actually one of the many areas in which practice has preceded theory, and the role of theory then becomes to understand the processes better, fine-tune it and systematize the thinking about it. Because just transition ideas have now been around for quite a long time, and perhaps the academics have come to it a, a little bit later and, and are, tr are trying to you know, make more sense of what is going on. So what I am going to do, I have been chairing a just transition commission in Scotland, uh, which is where I came from, come from. And uh, what I'd like to do, you know, quite simply, is just explain what happened there and then touch indirectly on the three questions that the organisers have set up. So if we could move to the next slide, please. Uh, this is, is giving you an indication of, of what it was, uh, the Just Transition Commission. It actually started by a collaboration between the Scottish Trade Union Congress and Friends of the Earth Scotland, recognising that they had some practical, practical uh, problems to deal with each other. So as a result of their persuasion, the Scottish Government at the end of 2018 set up this commission to provide it with practical, realistic and affordable recommendations that would help Scottish ministers think about the kind of the, the social and economic aspects of a transition to the net zero carbon economy by 2045, which is the legislated goal in Scotland, build on the existing economic strengths and assets, and, but then also understand very carefully the kind of risks that we face as, as we uh, move through that transition towards net, net zero. So the, it, was, it was a request for practical kind of things. Now, if we could just move it on uh, one more slide, and if I can get, get what the makeup of the Commission was. There certainly were academics in there. There was myself chairing it, and I had colleagues from the universities of Strathclyde and Heriot Watt, which are based in Glasgow and Edinburgh, respectively. But the other members from, came from uh, the trade union movement with two members, WWF Scotland, a community energy action group, Energy Action Scotland, and a number of people from the private sector, an industrial consultancy very concerned with hydrogen and carbon capture and storage, 
SSE, which is a big utility, and the Oil and Gas Technology Centre. And I would flag that a lot of Scotland's economy has been dependent on offshore oil and gas from the North Sea, which is a particular challenge at the moment. We had another group from the 2050 climate group, which is a younger set of people uh, concerned with the climate change turnover. And because of the importance of agriculture and land use issues, we had a member from Quality Meat Scotland as well. So this was a stakeholder group rather than an academic group, but with a suitable amount of academic input sitting alongside the people from the other constituencies. Now, if we could, could move it on, I think the question of how we operated was also uh, quite important. Uh, during 2019, before we were effectively closed down by COVID and had to operate by Zoom, uh, what we did for every meeting, we didn't meet in Edinburgh or Glasgow, the kind of the urban centres, we moved around Scotland. So in the top left hand corner, we had a first meeting at the Coalfield Regeneration Trust which uh, was, uh, is based in one of the areas where Scotland once had a coal industry, which is run down. And I would flag that Scotland has now left coal behind it. Our last coal-fired power station closed in 2016. So one of the things we're interested in there is looking at back and backwards and seeing how these transitions were managed. Bottom left-hand corner, we were talking with farmers in a rural part of Scotland about some of the challenges that uh, they face. Uh, bottom in the middle, uh, we were meeting with people working in the oil and gas uh, sector at the Oil and Gas Technology Centre in Aberdeen. And actually in the top right-hand corner, we were actually visiting the petro pe petrochemicals complex, but it's not very photogenic. So we took this example of uh, economic diversification into tourism, uh, wh which the area had gone into. So the key message is that we were trying to get out. We had meetings with stakeholders in each area. On the day before each meeting, we went on site visits and the evening b before we ran town hall kind of meetings to talk to people about their concerns. Now, if we move it on again one more time, please. Uh, we actually produced three reports in the two years of our existence. Our final report was in March 2021, this year. So we produced an interim report uh, about a year in that set out our initial thinking. And then about 18 months in, the Scottish Government asked us for a report on a green recovery from COVID and how that tied into the Just Transition agenda. And that report was produced in very, very short order. And then the final report came out in March this year, which I'll talk a, a little bit more about. So if we can move it on into our earlier thinking, this is the closest I think we came to theory, I, I think, in the approach. This was the guiding principle uh, that we used to guide us. So the imperative of a just transition is that policies are designed in a way that ensures that the benefits of climate change action, and there are benefits, are shared widely, while the costs don't unfairly burden particular groups of people. And to pick up on my first remark about practice uh, coming before theory, uh, we didn't start with this remark. Uh, the, the civil servant who was drafting the report put this in about you know, footnote three on page 26, and all members of the commission decided this was such a good quote, we elevated it right to the front because we thought it captured and set out the thinking that we had. So if we can move on one more slide again on just what the scope of what we meant by just transition. And we do understand that in many countries, and I can think Poland is one of these as well, the primary issue has been about getting how you in a dignified way that uh, doesn't disadvantage people get out of the coal industry. But that's behind us in Scotland. So we now have to think about really tough issues, right? What happens with the oil and gas sector? But we also wanted to think more broadly, not just about the supply side of the economy, but the impacts of the transition on consumers and the importance of communities and the importance of place. And Scotland, like every other country in the world, has existing injustices. And we were concerned that what we came up with could also you know, start to address these past injustices as well. And we particularly picked out issues around land tenure in the rural sector, fair work, uh, knowing that delivering pizzas and working at the Amazon Regional Centre is not necessarily the, the best quality kind of work, and energy poverty as, as, as issues that needed to be addressed. So if we can move it on again, one more slide, I'll move quite quickly given the time we've got. 
Um, so with a green recovery report uh, that came out just about eight, 18 months ago, I mean, it gives you a signal for what we thought were some of the main priorities uh, in Scotland at the time. So the first one is investment in warmer homes and anybody who stayed in Glasgow for COP26 uh, in a smaller hotel somewhere may have well have noticed the, the lack of good insulation on, on many properties. So a big a big uh, program on investing in warmer homes and other buildings, which brings triple benefits because it reduces emissions, reduces energy poverty, and it also provides a lot of employment for people doing deeper retrofits of buildings. A second one was related to a concern about the time of COVID, about a lack of trust in public transport. So we had a lot of recommendations about uh, maintaining uh, you know, faith in public transport systems and also helping Scotland to build because it's, it's actually a lot of hydrogen fuel cell and electric buses are built in Scotland and, and, and that was an issue as well. And then the final and very big one, this is probably the biggest political issue, is what happens with the oil and gas sector. So we had recommendations about speeding up decommissioning of the North Sea facilities and repurposing it uh, for, for low carbon, uh, which, which has a, a lot of uh, potential benefits. But there are also many other ways in which the skills of the oil and gas industry can be redeployed in offshore renewables, hydrogen production, carbon capture and storage, all of these skills work somewhere else. So then turning, uh, you know, just, just towards the end, uh, you know, to the, uh, the, the final recommendations that we made, if you could have the next slide, please. We made 24 recommendations to government over, overall, which we deliberately designed to be realistic and practical as the ministers actually asked for. And because 24 is too many to present, we divided these into four broad themes. And the first theme was about the importance of planning um, in, in taking things forward, because the lessons we learned from the exit from coal in the UK in the 1980s and 1990s, it was an unplanned and was a manifestly unjust transition. So unplanned transitions tend to be unjust. So it's very important that, we, that planning is there. So we made recommendations about having just transition sector plans for each part of the economy. So that was a very important part of it. The second part was about the skills agenda, making sure people had retraining in the middle of their careers. And in fact, there was a good base in early years education for the kind of economy which would be net zero. And there are a number of very specific things that are very specific to Scotland uh, that, that we picked up there. And there is in fact now a climate emergency skills action plan uh, and appropriate funding to, to sort of move that on. And if we could move to the next slide, uh, the, 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 the third part was empowering and invigorating communities because most people do experience climate change and other environmental action at the local level. And we had a host of recommendations about the way that uh, community groups conducted themselves and indeed the way that local authorities can construct their budgets uh, around uh, climate change in a more inclusive and consultative kind of way. And I would flag that as well as the Just Transition Commission, there was also a parallel citizens assembly running in Scotland, which came up with many recommendations that came bottom up from people that really actually had a strong set of synergies with what we ended up recommending here. And the final one is about sharing the benefits widely and ensuring the burdens are distributed on the basis of ability to pay. And I'll give you a couple of examples of what that means. So, for example, most of the cost of decarbonisation in Scotland and the UK so far has been borne by electricity consumers. Uh, there is loaded on electricity bills and that is manifestly not fair, uh, you know, in terms of people who have no choice but to use electricity for heating, heating their homes. On compa in comparison with their standard taxation, it's very regressive in its impact. So that's one example. Another example is how we deal with the electrification of transport, because electric vehicles will be coming in, and how that affects people in rural communities who may have less access, access to charging infrastructure. So these are the kind of issues that we're, we're thinking about there. Now, did it end up anywhere? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think the answer is, is yes, it actually did, 
because the Scottish government, uh, uh, there was a new government elected back in May, and as soon as it came in, it accepted all of our recommendations without exception, which made us all wish that we'd be more ambitious and asked for even more. But the biggest one was perhaps what we now do have is a special minister for just transition, employment and fair work, which as far as we know is a world first in terms of a ministerial portfolio. We have an overall just transition planning framework under which, which will set a set of sectoral just transition plans. And the first sectoral plan will be about the energy sector, and that's already in preparation. And that will cover things like the exit from oil and gas, the movement, movement to renewable energy and energy efficiency. And on the skills side, we do have that climate emergency skills action plan, a green jobs workforce academy, and a green jobs fund to help with skills and training. And just to say, we've identified many barriers to actually people making that movement. A diver on a North Sea oil and gas platform needs to spend about 2000 euros on retraining in order to do pretty much the same job on an offshore wind platform. And these are the kind of examples of reducing these barriers to smooth the pathways to new employment in, in labour markets. And just, I, th I think the, the, the final slide, uh, which I've got here, which is just coming up, next slide please, is that there will be a new, in fact, there is a new Just Transition uh, Commission. And the, the Scottish ministers again asked me to chair this in the second phase. And it's much more about implementation. The jobs will be to scrutinise and provide advice on all of the sectoral just transition plans to help develop indicators for monitoring and evaluating progress towards just transition and continue with the practices we had in the first phase of engaging very, very strongly uh, with, with, uh, with, with uh, people in communities. And we will be producing an annual report every year to make that all very transparent. So that's about the end of my presentation. If I can briefly turn to the three questions, I hope I have demonstrated that theory and practice link with each other. Though for me, I think I have to say also with my IPCC hat on, I start from the policymakers end of the telescope and ask how scientists can make themselves useful for the policy process. And I should just hope that I've emphasized there that so social dialogue, which was very evident from this, is indeed the key to the future. And that's the way that science needs to engage with the policy process. And I'll, I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor. You uh, absolutely did a great job uh, addressing <laughs> all three questions. And thank you so much for sharing these practical examples, uh, how you are collaborating with the local governments communities uh, and the process uh, um, that is going on in Scotland, all the recommendations are, are very, very important. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. And now it's time to welcome uh, Professor Febe Konduri, President-elect of the European Association of Environmental and Natural Resource Economist. Professor Konduri, I'm very happy to meet you again and uh, I hope that uh, this conference will be another opportunity to share your extensive knowledge and practice. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, be able to communicate uh, how we work on the uh, science policy interface. Uh, what uh, we do is uh, quite uh, similar to what it has been uh, described by Professor uh, Sekia before. And uh, let me start by uh, saying very quickly uh, that um, we work as a cluster of uh, sustainability transition. This is a cluster of uh, uh, research institutions that uh, I direct and uh, works on um, the different uh, pathways for supporting the sustainability transition. This includes the Research Laboratory on Socioeconomic and Environmental Sustainability at the Athens University of Economics and Business, where my chair is. 
The um, Athena Research and Innovation Center, which is the biggest center in the country on um, information uh, technology, um, research and innovation. Uh, there we uh, try to develop the green and digital transition pathways uh, within the sustainable development unit that I direct. I also um, direct the Greek hub of the uh, public-private partnership, the European public-private partnership of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, which is called Climate Kick, and it finances and incubates um, uh, uh, innovative companies um, that are focused on uh, technologies, uh, but also uh, social innovations that are relevant for the transition to a climate neutral economy. And then we work a lot with uh, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network under the auspices of the General Secretary of the United Nations. I leave the European and Greek hub. And this is the biggest network in the world of university and institutions that try to communicate science results um, research and innovation results that are relevant for the sustainability transition and to the stakeholders that will implement them. So it's exactly about the science policy stakeholder interface. Who is, is supposed to implement the transition? Well, the politicians, the policymakers, the businesses, the financial institutions, the civil society as a whole. Next slide, please. So we work on research and innovation projects, innovation acceleration and deep demonstration. It is important to showcase the ability of an innovation to um, help a local community, a regional um, uh, authority, a national authority, uh, in uh, the transition pathway, in implementing the transition pathway. And of course, a big part of the implementation is not just working with the stakeholders uh, in terms of co-designing the pathways, but it is about upskilling, reskilling, educating the stakeholders in order to have the capacity to engage in this transition. Uh, the transition is basically driven by technological advancements. Um, finances are important, policy making is important, but the transition is made possible because technological advancements are offering cost effective of alternatives uh, to fossil fuels. So uh, these uh, technological advancements need to be uh, communicated, they need to be understood and they need to, uh, by the stakeholders and the stakeholders need to have the skills uh, and knowledge to use these technological advancements. And it's a big challenge of our times during the fourth industrial revolution where we have an unprecedented pace of technological advancements. It's a big challenge whether uh, the labor force uh, is able, even universities are, are able to keep up the pace uh, um, uh, of upskilling, reskilling, and uh, communicating new knowledge and uh, capabilities uh, to uh, the um, current and future labor force, future labor force in terms of uh, university graduates and so on. Next slide, please. Um, Next slide, please. Thank you. So at the moment uh, uh, that we are speaking, we are facing a multiple crisis, of course, the pandemic, the huge recession that derives the, from it, climate change crisis, the uh, increased frequency and severity of extreme weather uh, events that is caused by the increased in average temperature. 
uh, of the planet, which is in turn caused uh, by uh, greenhouse gas emissions, mainly CO2 and methane. And then the biodiversity collapse, the collapse of the ecosystem services on which our economy and, uh, and uh, society depends on. So we are working on um, systemic, holistic, integrated and interdisciplinary solutions that include at all the different phases of the solution uh, design and pathway, uh, the uh, engagement of the stakeholders or relevant stakeholders, because it's important to address uh, these multiple crises in a systemic and integrated way. And we need to do it fast. And we know from the pandemic experience that the world is as resilient as the last country and person in it. And, uh, we also know that the way to solve huge uh, challenges and uh, huge uh, um, transformational um, uh, challenges, which is what we are called to do um, uh, today, is uh, through education. Is the most powerful weapon with which you can use, uh, which you can use to change the world, as it has already been said before me. Uh, next slide, please. So, what do we have in terms of policy making? In terms of policy making, we have the SDGs. It has been signed in 2015, New York, 193. Uh, countries. This is the only other agenda, the only other global agenda, um, in addition to the UN uh, Charter for Human Rights. We have the Paris Agreement, an agreement to try to keep the temperature of um, the increase in the average temperature of the planet below 1.5 degrees. We now know that we can only afford 1.5 uh, degrees increase in the global temperature. Uh, then we have uh, the recognition that the SDGs are really a very holistic framework and no SDG can be fully implemented without the others being implemented. And this is what the first uh, 2019 announcement was, a climate week again, New York, uh, we presented at UNSDSN the six pathways that can uh, operationalize the SDGs. And this uh, referred to um, well being and health, um, uh, sustainable cities and communities, uh, sustainable uh, use, uh, production of food, and sustainable use of water, seas, and oceans, sustainable uh, industry and decarbonization, and of course, the digital revolution to sustainable development. By the end of 2019, Europe shows its leadership in this green and digital transition pathway by announcing the European Green Deal with four main access climate neutrality by 2050, um, uh, reduction of pollution, clean tech leadership of, uh, Europea of uh, European companies, and of course, leave no one behind. A transition that will engage all of the citizens, a transition that will support the cohesion of uh, the uh, society. And of course, uh, the European Green Deal is supported by one trillion, some of it coming from the EU budget and some of it coming uh, from uh, hope to be leveraged from public private partnership. Unfortunately, early 2020, we have the coronavirus, many short run responses to the coronavirus. But of course, the main serious response, the medium run response, next generation EU, which includes the recovery and resilience fund, uh, 750 billion in addition to the multi-annual financial flame, uh, framework of Europe to be invested in the green and digital transition. All investments in the uh, next generation EU need to be 37% climate mainstream and 20% digital mainstream. And this year we have the climate law, first time that we have um, a, a law that uh, uh, supports the implementation that commits the member states to the implementation of 55% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 
and uh, climate neutrality by 2050. We have the EU taxonomy, which basically tries to streamline capital to sustainable uh, investments, which are explicitly identified investments in climate adaptation, mitigation, biodiversity protection, circular economy, a sustainable use of water and marine um, resources. And together with the EU taxonomy, we have the Sustainability Corporate Directive that makes very explicit the requirements for sustainability reports. It uh, as, uh, assesses the information that is included there. It um, digitally tags the information that is included there and also creates a sustainability uh, requirements for asset management. This is very important because we are mobilizing uh, through policy uh, the, we are transforming in a way the financial sector. We engage the financial sector in this transformation for identifying and financing the sustainable investments. And at the same time, we engage them in a responsibility to report uh, their sustainable actions in a very specific format that will be monitored. So trying to avoid greenwashing. And at the same time, we try to do that for their clients, uh, the companies. Uh, so it's a form of engagement that needs to, again, uh, invest in upskilling and uh, reskilling uh, the financial institutions, the entrepreneurs, in order to have the capacity to really engage in this transformation. Then we have the Fit for 55 package. These are 13 legislative proposals that are revising everything that has to do with uh, climate laws in Europe, changing the energy efficiency directive, the directive that um, um, manages the land use system, the directive that manages anything that has to do with mobility, fuels, cars, vans, aviation, uh, marine time, and uh, in addition, the emissions trading system, and at the same time, creating a social uh, facility, a social fund to um, support those that are going to be uh, regressively affected by all this climate law. So we have, in terms of a stakeholder engagement, explicit uh, in the European Green Deal, the Just Transition Fund, more than 100 billion um, that is going to be devoted to areas that are disproportionately affected by decarbonization. We have the next generation EU that again uh, allows investments in these areas that are uh, extremely vulnerable in this transition. And we also had the, the Fit for 55 with an explicit fund uh, to finance um, those that are going to be regressively affected by the transition. Uh, please uh, go on. So at the moment, uh, we uh, have a situation where we have a huge momentum for um, commitment to climate neutrality. After the COP, we have 40 countries committing to 2050 climate neutrality, China 2060, India 2070. This was, uh, this was the, better co the best COP of my life not because of all these pledges, which were unprecedented before, even though we are not happy that China and India are talking beyond 2050 for their climate neutrality, but at least they are on the map now. The US and China will continue climate negotiations. What made me especially optimistic is the fact that I see businesses and financial institutions really engage. 130 trillion worth of business and financial institutions vote to put climate at the heart of finance. And at the same time, we have the agreement to develop a global standard body to avoid greenwashing. And then we have pledges with regards to methane reduction, with regards to forests, stopping uh, deforestation and conserving forests, which is huge because they are major sinks for CO2 emissions. We have uh, the refinement of the integrity of the carbon market. And of course, we have 
the big issue of how we are going to engage in this transition, not only Europe and the developed world, but also the less developed countries. How are we going to create the fiscal space for them, which they don't have? And how are we going to transfer technology to these uh, countries in order to engage them in the transition uh, for uh, the uh, not just for uh, for their welfare, which is important, but for the overall geopolitical stability of uh, of the world. We cannot solve these problems just Europe and just the developed world. We need to uh, have holistic solutions for everybody. So we need to care about their en engagement. Next slide, please. Um, so this is how it looks now, the, the uh, real world action uh, based on current policies will get us to uh, plus 2.7 degrees Celsius. The best case scenarios, if we counting all the nationally determined contributions, all the long-term uh, strategies, uh, including all the pledges for 2050, will get us to 1.8. It's not bad, but the point is we need implementation. Next slide, please. And in order to implement something, it's not enough uh, to have policies. It's not enough to have the science. It's not enough to have the technologies developed and um, accelerated with high technological readiness level. You need, it's not even enough to have the financial means to do it and the financial instruments to incentivize it. You need to engage all the society, all the stakeholders. And it, this need is even bigger when you have to move fast. We cannot uh, uh, work, continue to work with gradual incremental changes. It will not be enough. We need to achieve these goals fast. So in order to really uh, engage in a fundamental transition of the economic, social and financial systems and trigger exponential change in decarbonization rates, in um, conserving biodiversity, and in doing so in a way that produces positive economic multipliers and produces new jobs, we need to transform our economy Next slide, please. We need to form our society and we need to engage all the stakeholders in this transformation. And the way we do it is through systems innovation approach. Systems innovation can be understood as a combination of systems thinking and the process of innovation, so as to enable transformative change within complex systems. And this is exactly what we try to do in all of our projects. Uh, uh, the last 10 years, we received competitive funding in our cluster of more than five a hundred million for exactly engaging in interdisciplinary projects that are guided through systems innovation approach. Next slide, please. So what we do here is that we start from the present and we co-design with all our relevant stakeholders, the politicians, the policymakers, the uh, businesses, the financial institutions, the NGOs, the civic society, and of course the scientists and the technology developers, the vision, the future vision. We agree on where we want to be by 2030, by 2050, and then we back uh, stage and we uh, develop the in detail, the technological mixture, uh, uh, the uh, financial pathways and the policy pathways that will support the transition. Next slide, please. So um, this is the approach we use and our results is, uh, are reported every year in the annual report of SDSN uh, Europe uh, on the transformations for the joint implementation of SDGs and the European Green Deal that I co-lead with Jeff Sachs. Next slide, please. In this report, we, um, uh, we develop through the systems innovation approach, 
uh, very specific, country specific for all European countries, technological and investment pathways for the transition. And we, within this, we identify the right mixture of renewable circular economy, nature-based solutions, climate adaptation projects, and digitalization that will pave the way towards sustainability. Next slide, please. It is important to conceive the implementation of the European Green Deal in a systemic approach, simultaneously addressing multiple objectives and policy instruments and technological solutions. And it is important to focus on the hard to abate sectors, cements, iron, uh, uh, petrochemicals. It is important to identify the cost effective uh, uh, mix of uh, renewables, uh, focus on transport, again, a very different we call a uh, sector on uh, railways and motorways and airways and navigation and of course focus on buildings uh, retrofitting buildings and new guidelines for new buildings next slide please and it is not just the energy system it's the land use system as well so uh, through the um, SDSN, we work with Fable Consortium that engages in identifying the pathways to, for the transition in the land use system as well. And the two systems are there, um, considered together. Next slide, please. And uh, what is driving the whole thing, as I said before, is innovation. And the good news here is that India and China are leaders in these technological innovations that we, we need for the transition. And this is a big hope for the globe because it creates a huge incentive for them to engage in the transition. Next slide, please. And in order to support this innovation, we need sustainable patient finance. Next slide, please. The uh, sustainable finance need to integrate the value of nature, needs to monetize the value of nature and integrate it in cost benefit analysis for identifying the correct allocation of resources. So we have natural capital, we have human capital, we have man-made capital, and we should be able to take all these forms of capitals into account when we are allocating resources to different investments. Next slide, please. And the other big step that we need to do and we are working on is uh, reconceptualizing the missions of our financial sector in order to give the ability to governments to play an entrepreneurial role to provide patient long-term strategic finance that will support sustainable innovation. So at the macro level, we need to reconceptualize financial stability and the missions of central banks to include climate and environmental risk at the meso level, we need national public investment organization to provide positive sources of long term patient finance. And at the micro level, we need to convince the companies and give them a capacity uh, to engage in sustainable practices and engage with innovation uh, so that they become the ones that will be successful in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, so Next slide. Uh, so it is important to do all this, but at the same time, not uh, engage everybody and make sure that we support the cohesion of the society. And the cohesion of the society, next slide, please, it will be supported by creating jobs. Please click to eyes. And we know that the European Green Deal uh, increases jobs by almost 1 million in the energy and energy related sector and additional jobs uh, in uh, other sectors. So jobs will cre be created. Next slide, please. And I will be finishing in uh, half a minute. Next slide, please. Next. And uh, although new jobs will be created and new fiscal space is created through the EU next generation, at least in Europe, we know that climate policies will have regressive effects on the vulnerable, some vulnerable groups, but we simulated in a general equilibrium analysis how these regressive effects can be mitigated. And actually we showed that we is a package of measures of redistributing the climate taxes 
revenues through lump sum uh, transfers, uh, through targeted energy efficiency measures, uh, through job retraining programs, through funding of subsidies for new low carbon technologies via general taxation. Next slide. We can actually achieve the implementation of the climate laws and at the same time we can ensure more equality increased gdp and employment next slide please so all is possible but we really need to engage uh, all the stakeholders in this transition and engagement really means upskilling and reskilling this is the sustainable development report that we produce every year as unsdsn next slide please and what is important to see here, next slide, is the performance of each and every country with regards to each and every SDG. And this is the performance with regards to education, with regards to education for sustainable development. And we see that we have a lot uh, to do uh, in order to really have uh, an, the ability as a population to engage in this uh, sustainability transition. Green means a goal achieved, uh, red means we have face huge challenges, and yellow and orange, we still have a lot of challenges to deal with. So the important message from this is educate, upskill, reskill the stakeholders in order to engage in the co-design of the technological policy and financial transition pathways and through this uh, systems um, approach you we can reinvent our economic social and financial systems in a way that we accelerate the transformational change that we need in order to save in order to support our welfare on this planet thank you very much for your patience Thank you very much for your comprehensive presentation, um, showcasing all the mechanisms uh, that can be used in the process of just uh, transition and particularly in phasing um, the technological investment uh, um, in just transition, which actually the science plays a key role. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Konduri. And now I'd like to invite uh, to the table Professor Katarzyna Jasikowska from the University uh, in Krakow, Jagiellonia University. Hello, Professor. Professor, uh, I have a question. Uh, in your current role, you focus on the role of education in increasing the awareness uh, of climate change. I would like to ask you, where do you see the biggest challenges in convincing people that just transition will have an impact on their everyday lives, but actually also have and will create uh, opportunities for people. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I will uh, answer that question during my presentation. So if you allowed, I will continue with the presentation and, I, and then I will go back please. to this question. Please do, Thank of you. course. Okay, so, um, uh, to start with, uh, I would like to introduce myself a little bit, and this is not only for my ego, but it is a key element of my presentation. Um, and I would like to, before I start, I would like to say that I totally agree with the person who was presenting before me, that engagement is the key factor of just transition. And my today's presentation will be in 90% about the engagement. So um, my name is Katarzyna Jasikowska and I work at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, which is a Polish university, one of the oldest uh, in Europe, uh, at which uh, about 40,000 students, we have about 40,000 students and about 9,000 people employed, uh, which, is, um, which means that it is quite a big institution and the biggest employer in the region. And I'm particularly interested in uh, globalization, in global education, and at the core of global education nowadays is, of course, climate education. Need needless to say, this is my topic number one. And the very final thing about myself, the most important one, which comes to this presentation, which comes to be, con which is very, really connected with the entire presentation, is that uh, I am very close uh, with the bottom-up initiative 
grassroots students in this initiative called Klimatui. And um, this is a very special uh, initiative, uh, which arose um, two and a half years ago, uh, and which gathers people who do not agree to further downplay the seriousness of climate and, and ecological crisis, and who built academic um, social movement uh, and work for climate justice. So this is the very short characteristic of this grassroots movement. And I would like to um, emphasize that I am a sociologist, a professor at that university, uh, and therefore um, I will uh, have a little presentation entitled a, sociologic, a Sociologist in Practice for Just Intergenerational Transition. So this word intergenerational transition is uh, very crucial for me because uh, in my everyday work, I work with students uh, who are more or less in their twenties. And these are people who will have to face all the actions we take or uh, actions not taken by my generation and older ones um, in the foreseeable future. So um, my presentation actually has only three points. Uh, the first one is petition to have a climate strategy at the university. The second point is um, uh, interdisciplinary cor course. And the third one is the results of the engagement of the Klimatui initiative. So let me move on to the first point of my presentation, uh, which is uh, the petition. Uh, and I would like to emphasize that everything started from um, a bunch of frustrated young people uh, who were convinced that the university is not doing enough in the face of climate and ecological crisis and shared this frustration uh, uh, also with me. So um, uh, people started to work and think what can be done. And this tiny, tiny initiative and engagement, uh, I would like to emphasize that engagement of a few people started a process of participatory discussions around uh, future climate strategy for the entire university. And this process was uh, has a very, uh, it was a dialogue, of course, but it was uh, even more than that. It was a participatory dialogue to which everyone was invited. Uh, uh, and I just to give you a hint how it looked like, it wasn't a, let's say, conversation uh, of a bunch of people for three hours, but it was a process that took a year and many people go through it. Uh, people from different walks of life, uh, from different backgrounds, different values. Uh, but finally, uh, there was a document produced uh, and uh, delivered to the rector of the Jagiellonian University, uh, who was happy to meet um, a delegation of Klimatui uh, in May, uh, uh, in previous academic year. And uh, what was in the document, I will not elaborate on that. If anyone interested, I may, I may uh, send you an uh, English version of it, but um, what what vision of academia emerges from that uh, process and from that experience. <clears throat> so the first of all, university is responsible, uh, is, should take responsibility for climate ecological crisis in a very systemic approach. In other words, um, being a responsible student, being re a responsible consumer, being a responsible citizen, is not enough. Systemic changes are required and these systemic changes uh, can be done by politicians, by institutions and by organizations. And the institution students can address in the nearest surrounding, the biggest one and the most powerful one is the university. Uh, there is of course the theme of carbon neutrality, just transition of course, social diversity, taking actions for social change, and of course, and on top of that, democratic and community values that should be recognized at every stage of this process and the implementation of the climate strategy. So this is just a few words about the, uh, uh, the very uh, petition that was accepted. 
And in the meantime, uh, people who gathered around working on this, uh, on this document uh, decided, by people, I mean students who were involved in that, uh, decided that this is very important to have a special course at the university that addresses this issue. And I'm not saying that we don't have courses on climate change, on, economic, on ecological crisis, on Anthropocene, uh, talking broadly about the, the entire bunch of things related uh, with one another and overcoming of planetary boundaries, but the special course that would be interdisciplinary. And I was uh, lucky enough to be there and I decided to coordinate that with the very, very strong support of my students who were, who were active in this uh, bottom-up initiative. And we designed a course entitled Challenges for the Democracy in Climate Ecological Crisis Era, Interdisciplinary Approach. What does it mean in practice? In practice, it meant that I had to approach many colleagues from different departments, people working at the university, but also experts, artists, non-governmental workers outside the university and, that's, and invite them to the course. And we managed to do that. More, even more, also students from different departments participated in that course. So altogether, I had colleagues uh, collaborating with me who are biologists, climatologists, lawyers, psychologists, um, economists, uh, person interested in neurobiology, uh, of course, sociology, uh, activists uh, outside the academia. And uh, last year, because this course will be organized for the third time this year, we had um, 200 people uh, present uh, uh, on the uh, Teams uh, platform uh, to participate in that course. And that is, I think, a clear indicator that the need is very, very, very strong and people are really interested in that topic. So um, what is the message I would like to give you from the experience of being in the process of preparing this uh, petition to uh, the rector of the university and being in the process of creating and uh, coordinating the interdisciplinary course. So the message is, first of all, that students expect interdisciplinarity because knowing about or learning about climate crisis from the, the major perspective is not enough. Uh, there is a very strong feeling that systemic approach uh, is a must and students want to take actions. Therefore, uh, part of the course, we're taking part in, uh, in group projects, uh, practical ones. Uh, some of them were uh, local, some of them were national, and we even had one uh, international project. And I would like to, uh, uh, to present uh, a very, very short excerpt of what students left me after the course because uh, apart from, uh, let's say, regular, um, uh, regular um, finding out what they think about the course, I was doing, of course, parallelly to that, I was doing a research and asking several people about climate crisis, how they feel about it, how they feel about the course, and, and so on and so forth. So three short excerpts from the young people uh, with whom I work. First one. The climate crisis was the first thing that motivated me to go to protest. It is something that, that I worry about every day, something that is always at the back of my head. The main reason for my concern about the future, an important factor of reluctance to have a family. The climate crisis is affecting my, is affecting my whole life and it is creating a sense of injustice. Uh, that person is 20 years old. Second excerpt. I thought I was a conscious, meaning responsible consumer and a person who cares about environment. And it was only these classes that made me realize how much I missed. And the third one, my biggest and most shocking discovery was the understanding that it is impossible to save the planet with the current ultra-capitalist approach. So these are messages from my students 
as far as the climate ecological crisis is concerned and how they feel about it. On top of that, I would like to emphasize that what is very important, the missing point in, in this entire puzzle is the emotions. So when you start to teach people about uh, climate crisis, when you start to listen to them and discuss things thoroughly, the climate anxiety things come, comes into the being. And this is the very important issue uh, when talking and uh, doing all necessary actions connected with uh, just transitions has to have to be taken into considerations. So, uh, so one thing is petition about climate strategy. Another one, parallel one, is the interdisciplinary course. And uh, what are the results, in a nutshell, of course, of this uh, of these processes? A um, few months later, after delivering a petition. Uh, we asked our rector to meet with us again and actually asked him to ful fulfill one of the suggested um, uh, propositions uh, in the petition uh, 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 about climate uh, strategy, which is um, establishing a climate council. And I'm very happy uh, to announce that this climate council uh, has been established and the rector of the Jagiellonian University accepted all 21 people were suggested to be included in this council, uh, people who have experience, uh, knowledge, um, and also a majority, majority of them are engaged activists uh, in the field of uh, climate uh, ecological uh, crisis. So um, in a nutshell, just to wrap up all things, I would like to emphasize that uh, having this, um, experience. I have a um, wonderful opportunity to, to share with you only, you know, the top of an iceberg of this experience, but in a nutshell, uh, what are the conclusions? That um, first, university, uh, of course, this is obvious, it is an institution um, in which you can learn about climate ecological crisis and also about practical solutions to them. However, uh, point two is that uh, universities is an organization that is becoming, that, that should become sustainable itself uh, and also resilient and also adapted to climate change as much as possible and as fast as possible with people who work at the university, with people who study at the university and with uh, institutions and organizations around him. And last but not least, and this is the most important conclusion that really, um, again, it is a kind of a letter and a message from my student. What we should do, we should blur the line between activism and academia. And I love this, this one. And I would like to translate it into my language because uh, I would not understand it literally that everybody has to become um, an activist within, um, within academia. I think it's quite unrealistic. But what should be done and what is realistic is to main the climate ecological crisis the main theme of entire uh, didactical research uh, practical outreach all kind of activities that university is doing um, and i think i will stop here uh, i can elaborate on that a little bit if you like uh, if you like uh, later on thank you very much for your attention and i'm happy to to answer further questions, if there are any. Thank you very much. Professor Jasikowska, thank you very much for this outstanding example of the actions undertaken by the Jagiellonian University, not just as an institution, but actually as a community of people who are engaged in mitigating the climate change. Uh, it surely proves that the academia is not just a place where, where we teach when we create the knowledge, but actually we create uh, the uh, attitudes and engagement of young people. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, give voice uh, to Professor Andreas Loschel from the Ruth Universidad Bochum and uh, ask you, Professor, you, in your research, you focus on economy. And economy may, is a very practical field, but for some people it can be quite abstract. 
So from your perspective, what do you think can, how can we overcome the, um, the obstacles um, regarding the, the impact of um, just transition and proving that there are some opportunities in this process? Yeah, thanks a lot for um, the invitation and the possibility to talk here. And uh, indeed, I would um, I would like to highlight um, as well some of the I think needs um, of uh, science um, or needs that science has to take into account uh, when tackling uh, practical problems. So, uh, if you start my slides, I've prepared some slides for that, and you can uh, just uh, jump to the second slide if you want. Um, I'm here um, as a practitioner, as an economist uh, that, that works for many years now on the uh, science policy interface. Um, so if, if you want, you can start the slides. Okay. Um, and um, in this policy uh, interface, um, I have worked um, for many years um, in um, um, activities that try to support policymakers uh, with scientific knowledge. And I think the, um, this interface between scientific knowledge and practice uh, received much more attention in recent years. And there are many changes, major changes, that are reasons for this um, uh, interest in this interface. For example, the greater accessibility of knowledge through the internet uh, with reliable but as well uh, unreliable and false information, uh, some growing sense of a post-expert world and um, the uh, emergence of um, problems like climate change or the pandemic which um, are you know, complex uh, wicked problems uh, that lead uh, to scientific conclusions that are very often expressed as uh, probabilities um, and um, um, uh, rather than certainty. So um, science is now um, far away from being definite. Um, I, I still don't see my slide pack. So yeah, I don't know, probably you can start this. That would be good. We don't have it. Ah, okay, good. <laughs> Excellent, I sent it yesterday. Okay, so, uh, so let me go without slides. Okay, um, so um, um, here, um, uh, we are facing a world now which in, in ideal um, is simple because in, in an ideal world, the gap between scientific evidence and policy is actually minimal. Now in this very naive view, um, we have a scientific consensus no, on an uh, objective and, and a comprehensive account no, of the relevant evidence and the policymaker, no, they are um, uh, here um, a centralized small number of decision makers and they are more or less following the scientific advice um, because that's uh, in this uh, naive world uh, their source of knowledge um, and uh, they understand what the scientists say um, and uh, implement uh, these um, evidence-based scientific contributions. But of course that's not how reality works. Um, these processes are highly non-linear um, and they are very indirect. Um, so uh, this link between scientific evidence, as I said, uh, very often um, not um, definitive, but uh, uh, with probabilities and uncertainties has to be translated um, into policy making and all these expertise and evidence is what we might call socially embedded. Uh, so uh, there are a large number of influential factors um, and scientific evidence is one source of information and knowledge. It's an important source, but there are many more. And, and uh, this is, um, uh, of course, as well an inherent danger. Uh, so instead of what I just, just described as evidence-based policy making, we might end up uh, with, with something uh, uh, that we might call uh, policy-based evidence making, where policy makers uh, are cherry picking uh, relevant knowledge uh, um, um, that, that supports their own course um, and claim 
uh, biased evidence um, uh, for their own purposes. And that's, uh, of course, uh, an inherent danger. And actually, the IPCC is an example. Uh, and uh, Jim Ski was just talking. I'm as well a lead author in IPCC, but, but Jim Ski is uh, leading the whole exercise of the uh, Sixth Assessment Report, Working Group 3. And the IPCC is an attempt you know, to find a common ground on sound sci science and to avoid this danger of uh, politicizing uh, science. And um, um, this means that um, scientists, they have to present their insights uh, differently. Um, they have to evaluate uh, different future policy options, and they have to think about their practical consequences. They have to um, show trade-offs uh, and overlaps, uh, but um, they should try to avoid direct advocacy for particularly for, for particular options uh, not uh, being as a, a political actor um, and they should as well uh, try to not solve these trade-offs in advance because trade of solving this is a job of the politi of the policy process and includes uh, of course as well the whole society um, in these endeavors so explore options and disclose uh, pros and cons. And I think that is um, the main um, role here, um, engaging in good policy making via committees or other things and um, uh, in uh, these different forms of uh, consensus building. Uh, and therefore, uh, the problems of the people, uh, which are uh, in the core of today's workshop, are so uh, important, especially since we know from a political economy perspective, there are a lot of vested interests uh, in these transformations, uh, which are heard very often much more in these uh, real, real, real political processes. So it's up to scientists to spell out uh, exactly the uh, implications um, uh, of different uh, political proposals. And um, uh, I wanted to uh, look at this uh, with another example. Um, um, and this example is indeed from the uh, coal phase out and the just transition in the context of the coal phase out, uh, because the second questions, uh, question we were asked to answer was how to connect um, um, science and society to find answers to the challenges of just transition. And um, uh, there, um, uh, I think it's good to look at an, a, a real example like uh, here, the, the coal phase out. And as you know, um, uh, this is a discussion that um, is also um, very uh, um, visible in, in, in Germany um, because we have uh, made uh, major um, major uh, progress uh, on phasing out coal in Germany. And that um, is uh, also discussed very often in the context of just transition, which is an old concept, as we heard, that goes back to the 1990s um, and uh, was uh, more uh, used um, in the context of um, trade unions, uh, uh, support for social assistance programs um, of workers that were uh, about to lose their jobs as a, re um, a result, for example, of environmental policies. It was, uh, let's say, um, uh, re-emerging uh, in the Paris Agreement and, of course, as well in the Silesia Declaration uh, in, in the uh, uh, 24th Conference of Parties in Katowice in, in, in Poland. And that um, whole concept of just transition actually asks for uh, a broader notion of what is meant. Uh, and uh, we've heard that as well from the other speakers, a broader notion uh, on potential negative consequences of these energy transition, uh, not only um, uh, on the affected workers, no, but broader uh, impacts on households, on consumers, on industry, on regional development, um, and uh, in, a, in a broader uh, perspective, a consideration of so societal impacts. And uh, I think that is very important um, to keep in mind, um, because here, um, what then just transition means is that uh, we have uh, specified roadmaps with consequences uh, of uh, coal plant retirement, with an assessment of the appropriate policy instruments uh, in the way to include 
key stakeholders in the process. And we've just learned, no, it's important that just transition is a transition that can be anticipated and allows for a broader adjustments. No? And this is uh, the role then as well of economists that uh, try to highlight what are the consequences um, of these uh, transitions for different groups. Uh, and how are these policy instruments actually uh, working and how are they affecting um, the uh, different parts of society. So we need a better understanding in detail um, of um, who will be affected by the transition, um, how these societal groups can be effectively um, addressed, and how these uh, powerful vested interests interest can be uh, counterbalanced. Um, so we have to take into account, as I said, um, things like uh, regional economic development and regional economic future. So uh, I have a clear structure uh, uh, how uh, we can bring forward these affected regions. But we have to ask or think about in a broader sense, what does it mean, for uh, example, uh, in terms of energy prices for consumer or industry? And we have to think about uh, how this is spreading not only beyond the regions uh, on the national level or beyond uh, individual countries. So it's much more than uh, just um, um, uh, decent jobs. Uh, it's much more um, uh, in a broader concept. And these are things that are difficult to assess, but very uh, important. And um, in Germany, for example, uh, what we try to do in order to connect science and society in the trends in the phase out was the setup of uh, a, a cold phase out commission. Um, so there are different forms of uh, public deliberation, um, such as uh, stakeholder dialogues or citizen assemblies or just transition commissions. We have just heard uh, all these examples. The idea always is to reflect the public opinion uh, and further, um, uh, further agreement uh, between these different uh, interests. And I think these are very important fora uh, that have to be strengthened. In the German case, we um, had a commission and actually it was called the Commission for Growth Structural Change and Regional Development. Um, uh, publicly, it was very often just called the Coal Face Out uh, or the Coal Commission. But as you can see from the title, um, the, um, uh, the uh, idea was much broader. The idea was to find a consensus oriented dialogue uh, between stakeholders and uh, representatives of utilities, uh, electricity users, trade unions, local communities, NGOs, academics, um, a few, uh, and state and uh, federal governments uh, in order to find concrete um, transition plans, measures, uh, and uh, roadmaps. And uh, um, as you might know, uh, the recommendation was to phase out coal by 2038, if possible, 2035. The new government <clears throat> just um, um, this morning yesterday, uh, now is going to target coal phase out for 2030, so um, even, even further. And the uh, German case, um, the German Coal Commission, uh, is an example uh, that uh, here um, we, we try um, to achieve a lot of different objectives in these, um, uh, in the work of the um, um, in the work of the commission. And in fact, the German um, commission was, I would say, less focused on uh, achieving what you might call throughput legitimacy or regional inclusiveness, yeah? um, because um, the, the stakeholder commission had uh, quite uh, some lags uh, or shortcomings in terms of stakeholder engagement, um, transparency, um, and um, uh, responsiveness. So there was a narrative of regional transition and structural change, okay, but uh, it was much more encompassing in general and issue driven. So uh, this might as well the the reason uh, why in the end um, um, we, we, we ended up um, with relatively moderate um, targets in terms of uh, achieving climate goals relatively late phase out, 
um, and um, um, a lot of discussion about um, the uh, these um, financial support uh, for specific for specific reasons. There are other examples, uh, like uh, for example the Canadian Coal Face Out Commission, uh, which was much more focused um, uh, on collecting and reflecting the needs of communities in the coal regions and commu communicating these findings to the federal government. That's probably as well uh, a good takeaway um, 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 for, for uh, similar endeavors uh, that uh, it's really important uh, to engage uh, on uh, these uh, local level uh, much more um, uh, than we have seen in the past in order to increase legitimacy uh, of these agreements. Um, because uh, for example, in Germany, this is still very heavily um, debated and all the, um, uh, the differences, they tried, they have tried to solve them with financial support for regions, but that um, it, it, at least so far has not really shown, shown a lot of um, um, uh, excess um, success. So, um, okay, so uh, to wrap up um, um, the uh, the, the two questions, um, uh, I think this is natural leading in the third question, is social dialogue the future of science? From what I just said, yes, it is. Um, uh, the, the answer uh, is, is for me is relatively clear. Um, scientists uh, in the past have mainly uh, worked um, in policy processes, and it's clear that these policy processes uh, involve um, social dialogue, and this will be much more important in the future as we are tightening up our climate policies, because with these uh, really ambitious targets uh, on a renewable build out, on, on infrastructure build out, uh, new um, electricity grids, and so forth, uh, we need engagement, and we need true ownership of societies in the energy transition. Uh, um, so uh, otherwise, um, these uh, drastic uh, policies um, to respond to climate change will, will not be implementable. Thanks a lot. Professor, thank you so much for your uh, fruitful presentation and also emphasizing the fact that, you know, scientists previously were engaged in the policy actions these days they are broadly represented across the whole chain of uh, creating the legislation but also consultation and creating uh, mechanisms for the just transition and with this presentation we come to an end uh, of the first uh, panel of the conference human faces of climate change uh, i would like to thank all the participants. I would like to thank all the experts, Professor Konduri, Professor Yashikovska, Professor Ski and Professor Loschel for your presentations and invite you for a short break. That will be five minutes break after which we will start the second panel of the conference. Over half of the world's population lives in cities. While each city is unique, they face similar challenges, including pollution, the climate crisis, and the COVID-19 pandemic. The exchange of ideas to address urban challenges, such as improved housing, basic services, and green spaces is critical. The World Urban Forum, known as WUF, is the largest global gathering on sustainable urbanization. The forum is convened by UN Habitat every two years. In 2022, WUF 11 will be the city of Katowice in Poland with the theme, Transforming Our Cities for a Better Urban Future. WUF 11 in 2022 will explore solutions to make cities safer, greener, and a better place to live. This is a transformation that Katowice itself has experienced. WUF 11 is organized by UN Habitat, Poland's Ministry of Development Funds and Regional Policy and the City of Katowice. We are building the cities of the future today. Join us in 2022 and be at the heart of this change.
National Center for Climate Change is the first research center in Poland focused on a wide scope of climate change issues, operating within the Institute of Environmental Protection National Research Institute. We provide expertise on climate policy, conduct climate change impact research and analytical works, deliver insights to decision makers in climate policy, support the Ministry of Climate and Environment as well. We focus on low and zero emission transport, adaptation to climate change in cities, just transition, sustainable investments and green cities, circular economy, green finance, business responsibility, as well as education and building social awareness of climate change, both formal and informal. Important part of our work are conferences and webinars for various groups of recipients where we connect public institutions, business and academic work on both local and international level. Global Immobility Forum, People and Climate Solidarity and Just Transition, Human Faces of Climate Change are the titles of the most famous examples of our annual global events. Every quarter we publish a magazine with different leading topics, cities and climate, green finance, just transition. These are the titles of the latest editions. One of our projects is eco-funding search engine, a portal where one can find all the options for financial support and investments in an ecological project. Another one is already very popular publication, Climate Education, Green Kindergarten, where teachers can find practical and ready to be used interesting hints and ideas for lessons with children. We cooperate with other research institutions, international organizations, academia, public sector, NGOs and business, sharing knowledge and building the awareness of the coming change regarding the new professions as well. Climate change officer, climate resilience officer, many new job careers in the mobility sector, to name just a few. Please follow us on our social media. This is Human Faces of Climate Change Conference by the National Center for Climate Change. Welcome uh, after the break. During the conference, we are discussing how to bring scientists and society together to find uh, answers to um, challenges related to the just transition and climate change. We are looking for ideas to facilitate the social dialogue, but most importantly, how to change, how to translate theory into practice. Uh, in the second panel, we have our distinguished guests uh, that will share their experiences and insights. And I would like to welcome Professor Bogdan Hoynitsky from Faculty of Environmental Engineering and Mechanical Engineering, Poznan University of Life Sciences. We also hear from Mr. Henry Weissman, uh, who is Senior Research Coordinator, Deep Decarbonization Pathway Projects, Institute of Sustainable Development and International Relations. And last but not least, we're going to hear from Ms. Magdalena Maria Kajak, Manager of the Laudato C Animation Program, Global Catholic Climate Movement, Laudato C Movement Poland. The first person to take place in the panel is Professor uh, Hoynitski. Welcome, Professor. It's it's a great pleasure to see you again uh, in our discussion about the just uh, transition. And without further ado, I would like to give you the floor. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, it's still morning. Uh, I just uh, wanted to, uh, to up, up just a little bit about the just transition in the context of the, of the education. Yesterday I was presenting some uh, social surveys of, of our society and we already can say that yeah people in Poland are, are scared of, of climate change which is from one perspective okay because the, the fear is just good at the beginning but, but on the other hand I would like to uh, say that I think this expression of fear was really uh, interesting to hear in Professor Yashikovska presentation because some some of her students were expressing really the feeling that the the, the world is ending. So 
it sounds very uh, it sounds very scary that the young uh, society, young part of our society, expressing this type of perspective. But on the other hand, the climate change is very serious issue, and we, I don't need to talk more about this. Uh, the conclusion from my yesterday's presentation was also that we are half sure that we want to leave a call. I think this is the effect of a uh, long time uh, period of actually the paradigm of, of development in Poland that that assumes that the coal burning is the is the source of of our development. I think we have uh, such experience. So only fifty percent of population is is pretty sure uh about about the the transition that based on the on the removing the coal and replacing this uh, source of energy with renewable energy i think this is a very great challenge uh in the context of of uh, social communication how to how to explain it uh, uh, uh the third conclusion of, after this survey is just simply uh, we are we are the basis that we are just ready to to uh, work uh, on the personal level, which means that people are very committed to do it. But the but the final analysis, what people think, what can they can do about the climate change, uh, is a little bit <clears throat> surprising because actually we are a little bit disoriented what to do. Which means, from my perspective, is that we, uh, of course, this is the only element of the whole transition, but we need really education. Uh, Professor Yashikovska mentioned about the about the course that was showing uh, different perspectives on climate change, the, the 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 effects of climate change, the future of climate change, and of course, this is very necessary to to increase the 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 knowledge about it and uh, how to find it. But actually, if we talk about the future, uh, a future activity, uh, let's say in the range of, of our country, but I think the same situation is everywhere. Uh, before we, we before during change, the changes, we just need to realize that we have a two efforts. The, the first effort is climate change mitigation, which is related to simply to the, to the uh, physical properties changes of the atmosphere. This is a really big issue. And I'm I'm afraid our society is still not very aware, well aware of this situation. But the other uh, the other uh, element of the of the whole conversion of the whole transition is is of course climate change adaptation. And of uh, and we have of, of course the the uh, really need of the educational of, at the all levels of, of the education uh, process. Uh, this is not the only scientific community that is mainly located at the universities or institute, uh, institutes, but we need to, to, to develop uh, education processes also in the basic and the secondary school level, because we, we should know more from the beginning what, what, is, what is really uh, going on in the context of, of climate change. Of course, academic uh, community can offer the education and this education is first uh, the first the step of this education is just showing how the climate change is working uh, from the perspective of atom, uh, atmospheric physics but finally how how what is the linkage between the, the uh, climate change and the and the rest of activity and of course the biosphere which is very important especially if we talk about the biodiversity uh, so uh, at our university, uh, at our at our faculty, faculty of, of environmental engineering and engineering, uh, engineering of mechan mechanics, we just uh, we just decided to start up the first level first level uh, study, which is called engineering of climate protection. Why the engineering of climate protection? We are talking a lot about the problems. So we are talking about uh, a lot about about the issues. We are trying to. We are uh, showing the the aims uh, that we is supposed to supposed to reach uh, after uh, in a certain uh, time period, but actually we have no specialists that are able to implement the the whole activity. Uh, the 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 knowledge about the, the climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation actually is very spread over the different disciplines. 
And in many cases, especially if you contact, if we contact uh, to each other, we see that there is really big discrepancy in the knowledge. Uh, we really have no uh, very uh, uh, common and global idea how to uh, how to deal with the with the with this transition. And uh, this uh, engineering of climate change protection course which is a first grade, grade study, it will con be consisted of such things like water management in the city because, uh, and management, water man management in the rural, rural locations. I think they are co completely two different topics. Even in, uh, at our community, we had a very, very big discussion how to, how to deal with water management, uh, how, why it is split. But you know, we know already that, for example, the climate mitigation in the, in the cities in the cities are not uh, it is only basis on the on the uh, uh, energy change but if we talk about the adaptation i think this is absolutely uh, important challenge uh, there is a little bit different situation in the in the rural area and the the, the, the methods and tools that are necessary to be applied in the rural area of course the agriculture and forestry rule in climate change is, a, is, a, is a really under the big debate uh, but again simultaneously we have no really experts that are able to to integrate this knowledge and to apply in the in the landscape and in the city in the in our economy uh, and finally i just wanted to say that we also have during this during this course we have also uh, aiming the issue of biodiversity uh, it's really hard to, to communicate biodiversity because uh, our world is based on the economics and, and uh, utility as a, as a way of understanding of anything. And biodiversity somehow, we can say, uh, from, from, a, uh, from a single person it can be considered as, a, as a useless. So there is no really knowledge about, about all, all system of the of the ecosystem services. Uh, I think the, the uh, academic community uh, can, can produce uh, this type of courses. This is our activity at our university, Poznan University of Life Sciences. Uh, I think this is the answer for the, for the transition, just transition, uh, via simply education, the people who, are, who will be able to, to integrate our efforts in the context of climate change. I have a feeling that we still have a lack of this type of, of persons and the persons who are who are going to feel uh, that their career is going to follow this, this, type of, uh, this type of activity. This is the challenge for the next 30 years. So, so in many cases, I assume uh, that, that uh, the people who graduate this, this course is just, this will be the basis for, for career. Uh, we must to we must to uh, support our society in in this transition uh, by the education and of, of uh, and the building up all other frameworks, economical frameworks, social frameworks uh, uh, as a, as a basis for just trans transition. But uh, academic academic uh, community uh, can serve with education support. Thank you. Professor Hojnicki, thank you very much for this perspective and one more time emphasizing the role of the universities and economic uh, community in uh, one ha on one hand uh, creating knowledge, educating young people about uh, the climate change and creating the awareness of climate change. But what was here very um, strongly in phases, also creating the career path, creating skilled workers that can in the future work in, um, uh, in new sectors of a green economy. Thank you very much for your insights. And now I'd like to invite our second guest, who is Mr. Henry Weissman uh, from the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations. Um, Mr. Weissman, from your experience, what are the best tools for involving society in just transition? 
And thank you very much. And uh, thanks for the question and thanks for the invitation to participate to this uh, to this event. It's a pleasure to, to share the panel with uh, colleagues for coming to the climate change question from very different perspective. And I will come to that, but I think that this is critical to be able to address the challenges that we are facing. Um, so I will, I will try to approach your question from the angle of uh, the question posed by national deep decarbonization, which means uh, the approach of trying to understand what it takes to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions or mitigation at the country level consistently with the uh, climate mitigation objective of the Paris Agreement, but also in a way that achieves key socioeconomic objectives as defined in each country. And here I will build on the expertise, the experience that uh, we have built over the year in the context of the deep decarbonization pathway initiative that I'm uh, leading at IDRI, uh, and in which we are working with in-country partners on this question of national deep decarbonization in more than uh, 25 countries. So be before going specifically to the, the question that are framing the conversation, uh, just a, a quick stock take of what science says about this question, because I think it's important to understand how to approach it because the magnitude of the challenge conditions the way we should approach it. So what science says about decarbonization? First, if we want to achieve the goal, we need basically to transform everything. We need to transform energy systems. We need to transform industrial systems. We need to transform transport systems, in um, building systems, land use and, and agriculture, etc. So everything. So it's a large challenge. And the way this trend, so the second message, the way this transformation can happen, uh, will vary from one country to the other. Uh, and it needs to capture the specificities of the national circumstances. So we need to renounce from the beginning uh, the idea that there would be any silver bullet that would solve the question in general, but rather approach this question of the drastic transformation that needs to be implemented, um, taking into account the specificities of each context. The third message is that if we want to create the pathways for the deep change that we are talking about, we need to adopt a long-term vision. And this is notably because we need to capture path dependencies and inertias that help capture the consequences of what we do in the short term for the possibilities of change at the longer term of reason, or horizon. And what we are doing now in the next few years, next decade, will condition to what extent we'll be able or not to achieve the deep decarbonization transition that is required by the climate uh, objective. The fourth message is that even if it's extremely challenging, uh, this is technically possible. Uh, and there are, I mean, not many of the current technically available solutions are sufficient at least to initiate the transition if we deploy them at, at the scale that's required. Uh, and in parallel, we need to work on technical innovation, but there is no reason to think that there will be um, a barrier blockage from a technical point of view. And this leads me to the fifth and final message, and I think which is maybe the most critical aspect in, in relation to the, the question that, uh, that uh, the question that are framing this conversation today, is that, okay, if it's not technical, or if the main difficulty is not technical, understand me well, it doesn't mean it's easy. There are lots of challenges, but that's not what will be blocking. So what, what may be blocking the transition? And here I'd like to highlight two points. The core of the challenge is linked to first, political economy aspects. Uh, in the context of this transition, there will be winners and losers, uh, and there will be social impacts of the transition where people would be affected differently. Uh, the, this transition will not be the same for everyone. And so in short, this is a story about people. This is a question of how people react and, and live with this transition. And the second core challenge is that if we want to address this question, we need to invent, invent packages of policies and actions. And here, I mean, again, there is no silver bullet. There is not one single instrument that can solve the problem, carbon pricing, it can be part of the solution, but we know very well that it's not with carbon pricing that we can uh, solve the challenge at, at the scale that's required. We need instead to invent some combination of actions and policies that can articulate um, actions by a variety of actors. And here, that's because very fundamentally, this transition will require all actors to play their role in the transition. Each different actors, obviously the government, but also the in local institutions, the private sectors, the investors, the citizens, all actors in the society, they have different levels, levers in their hands. 
And the question is whether we are able to activate these different levels in support of the collective transition. So that requires some articulation between different actors and different uh, decision makers. And here again, this is a question of people. Who are these people who, are, uh, who have these levers in hand and how to make sure that they can activate them in support of the collective transformation? So altogether, what science says, just to summarize very brief, briefly, it said that the main challenge is what we need to unlock is to align the expectations and to make sure that different people coming from different perspectives can play their role in a collective game that we need to play to achieve national decarbonization. So this leads me more specifically to the three questions that are framing the conversation here. The first one about how to translate theory into practice while providing scientific solutions to the problem of the people. So that's the first question. And just when thinking about it in the light of what I've said in the introduction, I'd like to say that I, I don't believe that the decarbonization challenge is really a problem of translation uh, in the sense that this concept would suggest that the theory uh, has some answers that would just need to be turned into practice. I don't think that's how, how this works. And I don't think that's how we may find the solutions. What science can provide is to explore some solutions instead of providing what could be the solution. The science will never say what is the solution, but it can highlight some of the solutions and should highlight what are the clear conditions, enablers, impacts attached to each of them. And the reason why it's very important that um, science, uh, it's very well perceived what is the role of science, is that when it comes to decarbonization, uh, it, there is not really a set of solutions that would be uh, clearly better than the others. If that was the case, honestly, and if we had an agreement of that from a scientific perspective, I don't think it would be difficult to implement that. The reality is that uh, we have different options, different possibilities, different strategies with different pros and cons. And the solutions, what will be concretely implemented is fundamentally a matter of choice, a matter of social choices. And this choice can be made in different manners, but my personal conviction is that choices that would be guided by a social dialogue, by involving people in the process, even if, I mean, obviously it's clear, it's challenging, I mean, how to organize the conversation, and we'll come back to that with the second question, but that's, this is the only way to ensure that there is sufficient ownership by the very people who will implement it. And it's the only way to make sure that those who will experience the transition, both the positive and the negative consequences, can be part of the process and not just um, takers of the solution. And it's the only way to establish efficient and accepted transitions. So making sure that science can provide the framing for a conversation, but that eventually this conversation should not be guided by the idea that science has some solution that should just be translated into reality. But science is here to help guide a social conversation in which there needs to be a kind of um, a, a social agreement as to what we are doing, acknowledging the consequences on the different actors and discussing collectively what is the combination of actions that could be done, for example, to manage the negative effect of this transition. Which leads me to the second question how to connect science and society to find the answers to the challenges of, of just transition. And here, before, before getting into that, I'd, I'd like to make a side note on the just transition question and the link between just transition and climate change. And I want to say that there has been lots of progress on this question very recently, and it's now very clearly accepted and acknowledged by uh, a diversity of actors that Climate change and just transitions are not two separate topics. They are actually the two sides of the same coin. Notably, it's impo impossible to imagine that we could implement ambitious climate actions if it's not done in a way that addresses the challenges of just transition. So what we're talking about here, when we talk about finding a solution to the climate change issue, it's not to find a solution of climate change independently of just transition, it's to find a way to address climate change and just transition altogether. I just want to say that this is now explicitly acknowledged in the international climate regime. The uh, recent COP26 decision has an article that, uh, so article 32, who, for those who want to, to go and check, 
uh, that invites countries to develop long-term low emission greenhouse gas emission development strategies, so the strategies that reduce emissions, towards just transitions to net zero emissions. And so this shows that there is officially now some integration between the dress transition issue and the net zero emission target, which is uh, the, the goal of the, of the mitigation action that needs to be put in place. So we need to, to cover these two topics together in the social dialogue that uh, I mentioned in, the, in, in response to the first question. And here the main challenge, and this is important, it's very important to acknowledge it, is that we need to build bridges between the different partners of these social dialogues. And we need to acknowledge that there is a real challenge in making sure that people coming from different perspectives, different entry points, different expertise, who are all very important uh, in the conversation, can understand each other. This is a question of establishing a common dialogue or at least a dictionary so that people talking about the same topics, but um, with different languages, different uh, um, expertise can understand better each other because it's the only way to organize the social dialogue. Having a dialogue, I mean, has as a precondition to make sure that people can talk to each other, can understand what the other is saying. And here in the climate and just transition conversation, at least from our experience, we see that in many cases, the core of the challenge is that people think they are talking about the same thing, but they don't, or at least they don't understand what the others are saying. So here we need to establish processes and methods that help bridge the different perspectives. That's not only the effort that we're doing in the context of the deep decarbonization pathway initiative, uh, where notably we highlight that the dominance of modeling, so technical modeling, quantified modeling, which is uh, really at the core of the climate change discussion and has uh, guided most of the climate conversation uh, until, until now, uh, it should be revisited. And here, don't, don't misunderstand me. I am a model as a background. I think models are very useful. They provide interesting insights, but they are not sufficient. Just because they are technical and quantitative angle to the discussion. And it's very clear that this does not allow an open conversation with full engagement of all non-technical experts. So it's critical that the modeling insights that can be provided to the social dialogue are complemented by a broader work on narratives that formulate the levels of changes and the socio-economic dimensions associated to them in a manner that's open and that um, allows um, a, a, a dialogue between people coming from these different perspectives. So here in terms of methods, that's the main uh, point that we are seeing is that we need to work with the two sides of the coin. So the quantitative side, which can provide a clear benchmark, a clear guidance, which is required for policy making, but not limit the, the dialogue to that, because if we do that, we would not allow capturing all the aspects of the just transition discussion, which are critical for effective implementation. And that leads me to the last question, is social dialogue the future of science? And here I will make a, a very short answer. I think the, the answer is clearly, no, it should not be the future of science. It should be the present of science. Ideally, it should have been the past, but uh, I, I don't know how far we, we were managed to get, but here it's extremely critical in this moment where the urgency of action on climate change and the urgency to find solution on climate change that can uh, be consistent with the just transition dialogue need to be found. We need, we need to find a way. It's extremely important that scientists do not see themselves as being those developing solutions in their ivory tower and just communicating that to the social dialogue, hoping that uh, then this can um, uh, adopt the solution that would have been provided by them. Rather, it's critical that the scientists see themselves as having a role to facilitate, to help organize the social dialogue. And this leads to adopting new methods and a new perspective to science. So for me, this is really the key agenda that should be in their minds of all the actors of this uh, discussion and notably all the scientists working on climate change, which is that their role is just not to uh, be outside of the social dialogue, but be an integral part of the social dialogue and engage with the social dialogue, not thinking that they would provide the solutions, but they, sh they should provide the information that is required for the society to find the solution that suits it.
I will start there again. Thank you very much for having me in this meeting and uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation and uh, very engaging um, answers to all the questions that were part of the uh, other part of today's conference. What I take from your presentation is that scientists, they can provide frameworks, models, guidance for solutions, but actually not the ultimate solution. The role is to create bridges and dialogue and actually facilitate the whole process, evaluate possible solutions, explore solutions and co-create with the society. And dialogue is not the future. Dialogue is the presence of uh, the whole process. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Weissman. And now I'd like to invite our next uh, guest speaker, Ms. Magdalena Maria Kajak. Magdalena Maria Kajak, she represents Laudato C Animation Program. Hello. Ms. Ms. Kajak, uh, we are actually talking a lot about the consequences and the aspects of the just transition. And sometimes we may have the impression that the economic consequences, the economic facts are taking uh, the, the, the lead um, role in this discussion, talking about the, the impact of um, um, you know, phasing out and going green. But actually, and this is what Mr. Weissman uh, focused in, in his presentation, it is about people because some people will be affected more than the others. And when we speak about the process, it is very important to include the aspect of values in the just transition. Would you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. It's really a pleasure for me to be among such a special speakers and beneficial to be able to listen to previous guest speakers. Um, in my presentation, I would basically like to touch upon the three main themes that appear in the question of the panels. I will try to answer the questions about the grassroots environmental initiatives, seeking a common language and, of course, a spiritual leadership. I will start my presentation with the spiritual leadership because its role is crucial. We, as the Laudato Si movement, defines ecological conversion as the transformation of the hearts and minds to our greater love of God, each other and creation. It's a process of acknowledging and uh, our contribution to the social and ecological crisis and acting in a ways that uh, nurture communal healing and renewing our common home. Ecological conversion was first used by, uh, in the Catholic Church by St. John Paul II during his prophecy of the 7th of the January 2001. And so St. John Paul II noted that a man and woman were made in the image of God and were told by God, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of, of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth, we read in the Genesis. But he pointed out that the relation is not absolute, but it's ministerial. He highlighted how humanity has disappointed God's expectation by devastating plants and valleys and polluting water and air. We must therefore encourage and support the ecological conversion, which is recent decades has made humanity more sensitive to the catastrophe to which it has been heeding, St. Paul said, said, so Saint John Paul II. Furthermore, he highlighted the goals of such a conversion, including returning to the right relationship between humans, God and the world, and living by them. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis echoes St. John Paul II, his Holiness identifies our current ecological crisis as summons to profound eternal conversion. What everyone needs, he writes, is an ecological conversion whereby the effects of the encounter with Jesus Christ become evident in the relationship with the world around them. In the book, The Ten Green Commandments of Laudato Si, Father George Tromkuritadam, head of the Vatican Ecological and Creation Office, writes that an ecological conversion calls for a return to the creator, a turning to God in a humble and genuine spirit of repentance, acknowledging God as the creator and the source of all things and repairing the broken relationship with God and each other. Father Kuritadam also writes that an ecological conversion calls for a turning to the creation itself as a caring and responsible stewards. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis shares the attitudes and changes within ourselves that can result from undergoing an ecological conversion. 
First is gratitude, recognition that the world is God's loving gift, gener generosity in self-sacrifice and good works, a loving awareness of universal communion with the rest of creation, greater creativity and enthusiasm in resolving the world's problems, and a feeling of responsi responsibility based on faith. We recognize that conversion is a grace of the Holy Spirit that is not fully dependent on our own actions, but we know, however, that we can open ourselves to be available to receive the grace for prayer and commitment and enter a way of life that is no more aligned with the gospel values. And it's most basic level and ecological conversion involves four steps. First is, of course, recognizing that we have harmed creation. We must examine our lives and acknowledge the ways in which we have harmed God's creation through our actions and our failure to act. Grassroots community can do it by reading scientific reports such as Living Planet report, IPCC reports on climate change, checking our own carbon footprint, conducting an energy audit, reviewing our consumption habits, looking for food, water and energy waste. Second thing is repentance and turning to the creator. It's not true that our irresponsible use of creation begins precisely where God is marginalized or even denied. If it's if it, the relation between human creatures and the creature is forgotten, matter is reduced to a selfish possession, man becomes the last word, and the purpose of human existence is reduced to a scramble for the maximum number of possession possible, said, said Pope Benedict XVI. First thing is commitment to change and becoming good stewards of creation. An ecological conversion must translate into concrete ways of thinking and acting that are more respectful of creation. The fourth one is community conversion. Ecological conversion takes place at the personal level, but as the Pope Francis notes, a community conversion is equally important. Social problems must be addressed by community networks and not simply by the sum of individual good deeds. The ecological conversion needs to bring about lasting change in also community conversion. We have many examples of grassroots environmental initiatives. As a global movement of Laudato Si Animators, which brings together commitment Catholics to care for our common home. In Poland, we also run our own program, Green Parishes, which aims to green our parishes both as a building and as a community. By this program, we want to send a strong signal to the world of our real commitment. That is, that is why the Green Parishes program involves concrete actions in the educational, practical, and spiritual spheres, to raise awareness of the ecological crisis, to implement solutions that translate into reduced energy consumption, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, improve air quality or optimized water management, and to develop the sensitivity rooted in the church's faith and teaching to care for our world. In order to carry our just and recent process well, we need to look for a common language to create a meeting place for people from different backgrounds, who from different perspectives will be able to work together for our common good. We need dialogue between scientists, decision makers, intellectuals, politicians and social workers, ministers, economists, activists and analysts, to respond together to the ecological, economic and spiritual challenges of our time. We should organize more roundtable discussions. An example of such a conference was the one we have been organizing with Pontifical University of John Paul II in Kraków every year since 2018. The aim of the conference is set an example of roundtable discussion. The human species is beginning to recognize that it's currently responsible for a life on a planetary scale. We have entered to Anthropocene, the era of man acting as a geological force. At the same time, we see that man does not control the process he unlashes. He does not control the technology that is turning the walls of our homes into transport screens. He does not control the financial capital detached from the earth and human labor. It is increasingly confronted with the consequences of climate crisis, wars over resources, forced immigration of millions of people and non-natural disasters. Many point, I believe, in the unique vocation of the human species and as the main culprit of the ecological crisis and call for the melding of men into the web of nature of technology. Many others deny human influence on the climate crisis, shifting the blame to natural process. Many finally challenge the belief that humans could make a difference at this stage to avoid catastrophe. As Professor John Milbank said at the last, um, at the first Creatio Continua conference, since man has dragged the whole earth into a climate crisis, it is a man who must pull us out of it. 
we are all convinced that this is, with God's help, necessary and possible. When we talk about human faces of climate change, I must mention about meeting of the ec experts in mental health and the climate crisis that we have this month. They share knowledge and real statistic of what's happening, especially among children and youth. Statistics were shocking. More than half of young people believe they will not have access to the same possibilities that, that their parents had. They think that the things that are most available to them will be destroyed. And they believe that humanity is at risk. They added eight of 10 young people think that people who have power have failed, while around 30% of young people are hesitant to have children for these reasons. A faith-based response for those involved in the climate crisis would be towards solidarity and spirituality. Talking about solidarity has always been a way of putting love into action, putting values into life and feeling that we are moving together in creating the kind of world we all want. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Magdalena uh, Kajak, for your uh, presentation, your insights. Solidarity and spirituality are those uh, two words that uh, you recommend as an answer uh, uh, to what's going on, the, all the processes, and also the anxiety that many of us can feel in the process uh, of transitioning um, and making the transition just. And with this presentation, I would like to thank you, the experts and panelists uh, in the second panel of the conference, Human Faces of Climate Change. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Bogdan Hojnicki, Mr. Henry Weissman, and Ms. Magdalena um, Maria Kajak for your insights uh, and input to the discussion. And I would like to invite you now for a five minutes uh, break after we, uh, which we will go into the final phase of the conference. Over half of the world's population lives in cities. While each city is unique, they face similar challenges, including pollution, the climate crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. The exchange of ideas to address urban challenges, such as improved housing, basic services and green spaces is critical. The World Urban Forum, known as WUF, is the largest global gathering on sustainable urbanization. The forum is convened by UN Habitat every two years. In 2022, WUF 11 will be the city of Katowice in Poland with the theme, transforming our cities for a better urban future. WUF 11 in 2022 will explore solutions to make cities safer, greener, and a better place to live. This is a transformation that Katowice itself has experienced. WUF 11 is organized by UN Habitat, Poland's Ministry of Development Funds and Regional Policy and the City of Katowice. We are building the cities of the future today. Join us in 2022 and be at the heart of this change. The National Center for Climate Change is the first research center in Poland focused on a wide scope of climate change issues operating within the Institute of Environmental Protection National Research Institute. We provide expertise on climate policy, conduct climate change impact research and analytical works, deliver insights to decision makers in climate policy, support the Ministry of Climate and Environment as well. We focus on low and zero emission transport, adaptation to climate change in cities, just transition, sustainable investments and green cities, circular economy, green finance, business responsibility, as well as education and building social awareness of climate change, both formal and informal. Important part of our work are conferences and webinars for various groups of recipients, where we connect public institutions, business and academic work on both local and international level. Global Immobility Forum, People and Climate, Solidarity and Just Transition, Human Faces of Climate Change are the titles of the most famous examples of our annual global events. Every quarter we publish a magazine with different leading topics, cities and climate, green finance, just transition, 
These are the titles of our latest editions. One of our projects is EcoFunding Search Engine, a portal where one can find all the options for financial support and investments in an ecological project. Another one is already a very popular publication, Climate Education Green in the Garden, where teachers can find practical and ready-to-be-used interesting hints and ideas for lessons with children. We cooperate with other research institutions, international organizations, academia, public sector, NGOs and business, sharing knowledge and building the awareness of the coming change regarding the new professions as well. Climate change officer, climate resilience officer, many new job careers in the mobility sector, to name just a few. Please follow us on our social media. This is Human Faces of Climate Change uh, Conference. Welcome. And now we are starting the final part of the conference, during which we are discussing ways to connect science and society in order to create more effective, engaging and just um, solutions in the process uh, of transformation. And now I'd like to invite you to listen uh, to the voice of Reverend Lauren Van Ham, Climate Action Coordinator from the United Religions Initiative. She is one of the uh, panelists and speakers uh, in, in this final panel. We'll also have Mr. Daniel Violetti, Senior Director from the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And last but not least, we will host uh, during the conference Miroslav, Mr. Miroslav Proppe, Chairman of the Board, WWF Poland. So firstly, I would like to invite you to listen to Reverend Holland Van Ham. She represents United Religions Initiative and her voice will firmly um, give an input uh, towards discussion about involving different communities and religious and indigenous groups in the dialogue about the transition. Hello, my name is Lauren Van Ham, and I serve as the Climate Action Coordinator for the United Religions Initiative, or URI. URI is an organization comprised of interfaith cooperation circles around the world. Cooperation circles range from seven to 200 members who join together across three or more religious beliefs, spiritual expressions, or indigenous traditions to conduct grassroots efforts that improve their lives and communities. This sort of cooperation relies on sacred teachings, science, and indigenous traditional knowledge. When combined, just transitions become possible every single day. At URI, these are happening mostly at a local or regional level. Very often, some translation and personal connection is what is needed when suggesting unfamiliar scientific solutions to meet the needs of people. In India, for example, clean water and sanitation is a big concern. One of the cooperation circles there, the WASH Alliance, has found ways to provide both scientific education and community support to assist those living in remote areas in protecting their water sources and constructing toilets. The best way to implement these changes is through hands-on experience and person-to-person -person conversation. Worldwide, there is a great deal of work to do, and the challenges of just transition are large. For example, some of the cooperation circles in Western India and in Mozambique are working hard to defend their riverbanks and shoreline due to sand that is in demand to create solar panels. Even though science points to solar energy implementation as necessary for us to attain our net zero emissions goals, there is a lot of care and communication that will be required in order to respect land, resources, and the lives of all species calling these spaces their home. The UN Sustainable Development Goals do a comprehensive job of illustrating the benchmarks for both science and social needs combined if we are going to successfully cap 
and even begin to sequester the carbon currently threatening life for future generations. But science and people must work together and find points of commonality and compromise, which is why the guiding, which is why the guiding principles for a just transition are so, so imperative. Reflecting on the challenges of just transition and thinking about a number of URI cooperation circles, I am struck by the initial obstacle of change. Humans don't much care for it. Even when data or charts indicate that the change will bring benefit, it can be met with a lot of resistance and grief. Two examples. Last year in Tanzania, there was an effort to introduce the practice of cooking with biogas. A large biodigester was built, and by feeding it biomass and food waste, it produced both liquid fertilizer for the gardens and biogas for cooking. A biodigester eliminates the need for cutting trees to be used for firewood, as well as the need for cooking over flame. Using biogas to replace wood is so good on so many levels that with deeper analysis, it meets nearly every one of the 17 of the UN's SDGs. However, there was great concern in the area that food cooked using biogas would not taste as good as the food cooked with fire. As a community building exercise, the people did an experiment and offered a blind taste test of food cooked using both methods. The biogas won, and this form of science is now at work protecting and restoring Earth in many measurable ways. Second example, in Malawi, there is a massive tree planting effort underway. It encourages smallholder farmers to plant native fruit bearing trees, and the community is working with conservationists, farmers, youth groups, and others to plant more than 20,000 trees over the next several years. This effort would be financially impossible in this region, but for a group of funders and technicians who are helping to document the project by geotagging each tree. These trees will be adopted and paid for by people around the world who wish to support reforestation efforts. The challenge is this, how to convince the smallholder farms that this agroforestry will be worth the effort. Malawi is presently experiencing record heat the seedlings are severely stressed, and if the trees even make it, they will not produce food or the revenue connected to the food for several years. Wouldn't it be simpler to plant vegetables and carry out a minimal existence that way? Well, the science and traditional knowledge, as we know, tells a different story. With more trees in the area, there will be less erosion of invaluable soil, there will be natural shade and windbreaks, the pollinators will return to support other plants, there will be fruit, fruit and greater food security, and the economic well-being of villages will increase if they can manage to keep the tree seedlings alive. In order for just transition to work, the need for on-the-ground education and hands-on support is truly great. There are some very encouraging examples of science, society, and faith working together to influence decisions for communities, institutions, and entire regions. In the United States, wildfires have ravaged huge sections of the state of California. Last year, firefighting officials at the state level began working with indigenous groups who have for hundreds of years used control burning practices to tend and care for the land. Previously, there was little to no communication between indigenous nations and forestry workers. But now, some plans are in place that create greater job security and better land tenure. Another very inspiring example this year has been a cooperative training effort between UNEP's Faith for Earth Initiative and URI. Together, we have created projects in India, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Lebanon. In these locations, we have been inviting stakeholder engagement with education and training days. Every training day includes information on the science of climate chaos and the biodiversity loss that is at stake, 
as well as sacred teachings that represent the religious beliefs of those in attendance. Appreciating the science and spiritual teachings, the trainees are then encouraged to design and implement plans in their own communities to address one of three areas, pollution and waste reduction, water conservation, or more broadly, climate action. In India to date, more than 20 grassroots projects have evolved from this training, and they are already generating greater commitments to waste reduction, as well as impressive work in regenerative agriculture and food security. The success of these projects has very much been about bringing different perspectives together. No one arrives with expertise in every area, but over the course of the training, everyone leaves with a greater appreciation of skill sets that had previously felt intimidating, unfamiliar, or just unimportant. It is absolutely true that systems begin to change as our individual hearts and minds begin to change. However, it is also true that for a transition to be just, everyone must participate in the change. I would like to share a quote that perhaps many of us have heard before. It is from Gus Speth, an American environmental lawyer and advocate who co-founded the Natural Resource Defense Council. A number of years ago, Gus Speth said, I used to think that environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. Whether or not we are able to reduce greenhouse emissions to the extent required in the next five years, nearly everything as we have known it is going to change. To survive it in a good way, in a peaceful way, in a loving and just way, requires each one of us to change. We must listen and begin to appreciate the multiple perspectives of science, faith, and what is needed for everyone to have a pass at a sustainable, healthy existence. It won't be easy, but it could be wonderfully creative and rewarding. It is my intention to remain curious and courageous, and I hope that you will all join me as we work toward a healthy recovery and a just transition for beings everywhere. Thank you, and I am wishing you much goodness as a result of today's conference. Thank you so much, Reverend uh, Lorian Van Ham, for emphasizing the fact that to make the transition effective, we actually need to start from intellectual and spiritual transitioning uh, of the values and beliefs that we have, but also in facing great examples, proving that science can be a leading force in convincing people who are very often resistant to change that um, using some solutions can make uh, their life not only more effective, but it can also be aligned and integrated with respect with traditions, cultures, and religious and spiritual um, uh, actions. Thank you so much for this uh, voice in our discussion. And now I'd like to invite uh, to the table Mr. Daniel Violetti, who is a senior director um, at United Nations Framework for Climate Change. Senior Violetti, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to speak on behalf of the UNFCC Secretariat to this very important conference and the topic we are discussing today. It's really critical in, in looking at the transformation that we want and the future of the planet. So just transition is really increasingly and acceptably seen as one of the enabling strategies for the life and climate action. And climate ambition in our process is not only about numbers, but it's more important about people and their transition in a sustainable manner, offering them decent 
and quality jobs and economic growth. There are 3.3 billion workers in the world, and many are already suffering from the impacts of the climate crisis, uh, whether it's due to heat stress, drought, flooding, storm, and otherwise. Uh, but on the other hand, we also know that mitigation actions, such as transition out of fossil fuel based sectors, will also impact that 3.3 billion strong workers. So it's a delicate transition. It must be a just transition. It can only be realized by having cooperation between science and society. It should be issues for governments, of course, uh, but society and businesses as well. Government, business leaders, and society must work together to help provide the policies and programs to facilitate such a transition. And while it's clear that the governments have the responsibility to provide the policies. And, and the broad framework for a just transition, uh, including integration of skills, development plans, uh, social protection, uh, labor policies, and, and mechanisms to um, fund this transition. And at the same time, uh, science and business have their bits to inform and implement these actions. Business to engage in social dialogue with the impacted community to plan the just transition is absolutely key. And society has to engage in providing all necessary inputs in policy planning and also to plan and execute the transition with minimum of the adverse impacts on the lives of people. In fact, if we look at the, the labor market, the state fastest growing jobs in several economies are those related to solar, wind, and geothermal energy and related businesses. But we cannot realize or reap. All these benefits, unless the transition policies are planned adequately. Experts are required to be engaged in policy planning processes uh, using latest tools and methodologies. Policy planning should be informed with the latest science uh, by undertaking ex ante and ex post assessments of impacts of policy on people and businesses. Good news is that parties, our uh, parties to the Convention and the Paris Agreement, are making progress on this matter um, at the national level, of course, and also under the, our UN climate change uh, intergovernmental process. So, if you allow me to say a few words on, on what has happened uh, at COP26 in Glasgow, which just uh, uh, concluded that. Uh, Parties and providers implementing the, uh, their pledges it should be ensured that a just transition is promoting sustainable development and eradication of poverty and creating decent work and quality jobs. So parties in, in this decision further mention that this will require financial flow consistent with a pathway towards low greenhouse gas emission and climate resilient development, deployment and transport technologies, and provision of support for those in need. In addition, uh, with uh, respect to having uh, just transition to promote sustainable development uh, and, and put just transition to practice, uh, our parties have also provided a specific recommendation through the forum and the Katowice Committee on Impact to bring just transition in practice. Let me say a few points on this. Uh, and this recommendation, parties are encouraged to engage relevant stakeholders at each step of the process of designing and implementing planning mitigation policies and policies to achieve sustainable development, including through social dialogue when possible and of course subject to national circumstances. The relevant stakeholders in this decision identified among others workers, employers, organizations, academia, public and private sector, unions, and civil society. So they further the COP encourage parties to explore complementary policies, such as economic policies, social protection, and labor policies, to help strengthen the outcome of the implementation of these mitigation strategy plans, policy and programs, including, of course, uh, national determined contribution and, and low emission development strategies are our uh, big plans to contribute to the achievement of the new strategy. And further, it's also was mentioned earlier, strengthening international and regional cooperation as this contributes to our planning, implementing mitigation policies. 
with social and environmental uh, benefits. Uh, uh, for example, to uh, facilitate uh, uh, technology development and transit. So, um, furthermore, the, the Katowice Committee on Impacts uh, um, also prepared specific work on the assessment and analysis of the impacts of the implementation of, uh, as was mentioned, to facilitate the undertaking of the various vacation and um, transformation and drug transition before our work. So, this whole technical war really aims uh, in supporting countries in planning uh, the transition policies uh, uh, that are well informed uh, and understanding the impact of this. So while we're looking at the, the revised and updated national plans with uh, the National Development Contributor or SDPs, uh, um, it's clear that more parties have considered social and economic consequences uh, of mitigation measures and of just transition. So this, this type of conversation are really critical and timely. We need to really look how to translate this into concrete actions. Uh, Involving all the sectors and all the actors, and not really yet to, to, to see that this is a, this is a multi uh, cultural uh, discussion coming from many different fields and many different uh, points of view. So, as we see, the countries have already uh, recognized an equal impact of policies of uh, different groups of society and all the workforce and sort of plans to address such impacts. Uh, uh, by including the concept uh, of uh, the transition there overall in this implementation, uh, including through the transition mechanism. So uh, by also uh, having laws and strategies for protecting workers uh, and, and social mechanisms for job creation, skill development, uh, and employment policies. Uh, and all this done in, in uh, consultation across the various actors. So, Additionally, and to conclude uh, on a good note, a few are also planning to give special attention to um, addressing the impacts of our groups and communities uh, in relation to poverty, job opportunities, and inequality during the transition. So it's, it's, a, it's a process. It's a process, it's taking time, but it's, it's important that it's well done and that everybody is heard and brought together along this line. And then, uh, you know, we are. Uh, at the beginning of this, uh, and, and, the, and you can see that even if we are at the beginning of this, the importance is dramatically growing as we move forward. And the years ahead are very critical, as we know, as we move to the next COP27 in Egypt and then COP28, where there will be the first global COP day, where we, we can uh, uh, look at where we are in our path to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. So I am confident that all these aspects related to this social dialogue and uh, the opportunities for a just transition further highlighted and discussed. So I can stop here and for what we can discuss uh, uh, along with you. Thank you again for the opportunity and uh, I look forward to discussing. Thank you. Director Velletti. Thank you very much uh, for your insightful voice uh, in the discussion and emphasizing the importance of social dialogue, bringing all the actors and stakeholders uh, to the discussion, both on the governmental and uh, local level, uh, bringing uh, communities and those who are um, directly impacted uh, by the transition. Thank you so much. And now, um, last, but not least uh, presentation and voice for, from our guest uh, speaker, who is Mr. Miroslav Proppe, chairman uh, of the board of WWF Poland. Uh, welcome to the conference. It's great to have you with us. Yesterday, we had uh, another um, voice from WWF Poland sharing experiences in facilitating uh, the, the mayor's uh, act activism and activities. And I would, today we would like to hear about your perspective in bringing science and society together and working for the best uh, solutions uh, in just transition process. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation to, to this conference. It's a pleasure and honor to, to be hosted here and to 
to have a voice. And thank you that uh, we could share our experience yesterday and also our perspective today. Yes, so first of all, how to bring the, the science and the scientific knowledge to, to the society. I think the first thing is uh, not even uh, so much in, a, in talking, but really at the, in discussion, in discussion with the society. And uh, talking is uh, sometimes, uh, you know, like uh, speaking ex cathedra, uh, giving a lecture, but not necessarily this message that we are conveying is accepted by the, uh, the audience. Uh, so really engaging discussion is a key uh, issue. That's why we are running this forum of mayors. Uh, and that's why we are very much engaging uh, and proposing to all the parties to, to discuss and really um, to have a deeper discussion. But the discussion to be really successful need to be managed, needs to be facilitated. And uh, I think this is a little bit a deficit in, uh, in our country that we are not using uh, the professional facilitators for, for many of the discussions and, and uh, meetings. Sometimes uh, it's uh, just two sites or three sites who are meeting and uh, each of them have their own arguments and their own emotions and fears and uh, solutions and agenda, which is natural. But then without the facilitator, it's, it is very hard to really get to the real issues, to open them up, to um, discuss them uh, in details, and then to find a solution and next steps. So really, um, facilitated discussion is uh, something that uh, is very crucial, especially during the transition time, because in the transitions, what, what we need to do is, of course, use the science uh, for new solutions and so on, but especially on the way from today to the new state, to the desired state, is it's an emotional process and uh, those emotions need to be managed and they can be managed in the discussion when the discussion is facilitated. Um, so the first key is the facilitator and then the second key for the successful transformation of the science uh, to the society is also the way how the, the facilitator is getting the group so the, the group is diverse it's not only the one group uh, uh, where only one emotion or one point of view can be can be heard but also that uh, many different groups may hear different uh, points of view and different opinions and then it's a feeling about the common sharing of some issues and challenges and common working uh, on the on the solutions. So the solution is really then developed and and uh, work out by the group and much easier adopted by the by the wider group. We had a couple of examples how it uh, how it works uh, in Poland and the very good example is the uh, development of the just transition plans in Eastern uh, Wielkopolska or in uh, Lower Silesia, especially where exactly this model was adopted. There was a moderator, someone who was not emotionally involved in the, in the issue, but was moderating the, uh, the discussion with the flow uh, leading to, to working out the solution, practical solutions uh, for those regions. So really that, that we could see that uh, it has uh, helped. It also was on the, on the national level. Uh, and uh, when I had an opportunity to discuss it with the Ministry of Climate, uh, we jointly agreed that uh, it is much better to involve the parties and to moderate the discussion. And anyway, we will finish with what we think at the beginning, what are the uh, directions of the just transition, uh, but it will be worked out in the common process with the participation of uh, many stakeholders and then it will be easier to, uh, to implement this. The need of this facilitated discussion is also reflected at the, at the plan to create the uh, National Agency for the Just Transition and then we are very happy that this idea is um, embedded there. And the second point I wanted to raise is that it's also important um, if we have uh, some intermediaries, people who are conveying the message, uh, the scientific message, sometimes crafted in a language that is too scientific for general audience. 
and presenting those ideas and those uh, uh, information in a in a language of benefits of a given group so when speaking to the miners or when speaking to the construction uh, sector or when speaking to the agriculture sector and so on and so on we need those intermediaries who are trusted by those groups and then using those trusted uh, intermediaries to convey the the message it's very hard to get the trust especially when you ask someone to start the transition to move from today to the new unknown uh, state it's as i was saying very emotional process that's why those trusted intermediaries are very very much uh, needed and um, uh, this is called again from the scientific point of view this is called the multi-level perspective theory of change uh, and transformation but this is exactly uh, what is uh, what is needed because then uh, it is much easier to get the involvement of, of uh, people. But there are very two crucial elements uh, for selecting the, uh, the intermediaries. You need to know exactly what is the goal. What do you want to achieve from this discussion? Is it giving the knowledge, raising the awareness of the problem? Or is it uh, working out the solutions? Because then you need different intermediaries, different uh, personalities or organizations uh, to to do it some are much better in communicating and uh, explaining and some are much better in working out and developing solutions so depending on the goal you need to select those intermediaries and the second um, uh, is how much really this intermediary is really trusted with uh, with the um, with the the group that you want to speak to and work with uh, sometimes, uh, uh, or maybe even maybe quite often, this is done that the central level government uh, sends his messenger, whoever he or she is, or an institution, but this messenger is already labeled uh, to be the government uh, representative or uh, how whatever is perceived. And this might be a blocker of a good communication and good in, um, uh, intermediaryship. So this is also very important to find really someone who is trusted with the group. So goal and then a trusted advisor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insights and emphasizing the importance uh, of facilitated discussions and trustworthy, uh, trustworthy uh, intermediaries who are able to convey message to a target group that is showing benefits uh, of the just transition. Thank you so much uh, for all the insights and practical case studies that uh, were presented by all the experts, panelists uh, of today's conference. Uh, we are very grateful for your participation and input uh, in the conference. Um, I would like to share with you the key insights, key messages that uh, were highlighted today by our experts and um, our guests, so that there are some lessons that we can take from this conference. First of all, I would like to quote uh, Professor James Key, who said, in just transition, practice has preceded theory. So theory needs to catch up now help understand and further shape practice. This dynamic is very useful in evidence-based planning. Unplanned transitions tend to be unjust. Further, we've heard from Professor Febe Konduri, and she said, financing, policy making, and involving stakeholders are important, but just transition is made possible by the technological uh, advancements and increasing, uh, increasingly cost-effective availability of new technologies. It is very important to communicate to stakeholders and help them acquire skills to use those technologies. We also have heard from Mr. Daniel Vialetti, and he said, it is clear that awareness of the social and cultural impact of just transition policies is increasing. Discussing this is critical because the social acceptance for transition is the key 
for its success. We've heard from Mr. Miroslav Proppe. We have to keep in mind that social dialogue has to be properly facilitated. The parties need assistance in coming to an agreement. And last comment and last uh, message would like to share with you is from Mr. He Henry Weisman, who said, what is implemented is a matter of choice, a choice that has to involve social dialogue and social engagement to ensure proper ownership of choices so, so that society accepts the responsibility for the process. With regards to whatever social dialogue is the future of science, the answer is simple. It should already be the present. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for spending this day with us and for um, being here and learning from, from our experts. On behalf of the organizer, the National Center for Climate Change, I would like to thank the honorary patrons of today's conference, the Minister of Climate and Environment of the Republic of Poland, European Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth, Maria Gabriel, and Vice President of the Polish Academy of Science, Professor Paweł Rowinski. Thank you so much uh, for your involvement in creating this incredible event. We do believe that all the voices uh, that we've heard from our guests will serve us on inspiration, as guidance for further actions to lead uh, the just transition process involving different parties, not leaving anyone behind the process, making the process uh, just, inclusive and uh, effective. With this, I would like to thank you so much uh, for being here. It was an honor and a pleasure to spend uh, this time with you. And I do believe and hope we're going to meet soon uh, discussing the just transition processes. Thank you so much.